not that you be not judged. As we come to as we come to our seventh mark of a biblical church or a healthy church, we're dealing today with the issue of church discipline. Many people will point to this passage nowadays and say, you know, there you go. The church can't discipline. You shouldn't judge people. It says very plainly in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not lest you be judged. Of course, what's interesting about this is usually when people point that out, they're usually trying to escape from the reproof and the correction that is being offered to them from the Word of God. You know, there was a time, especially in Presbyterian and Baptist circles, where, where reproof and correction uh, and admonition and even excommunication were common. They were part of the church's life. But now they've become almost extinct, even in Baptist circles. Excommunication, admonition, rebuke, exhortation, these things have gone by the wayside. Um, they're almost dinosaurs. And usually if you mention church discipline today in your average social circle, people gasp. People associate it with all kinds of uh, problems. One thing that's interesting, though, is that the same Christ who said, Judge not, lest you be judged, also said in the same book, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So whatever he meant in 7.1, we know that it does not stand in contradiction to what he says in 7.24. Also, the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth in dealing with the man who was in blatant public sin there in that church, do you not judge those who are within the church, he says, but those who are outside, God judges, but you remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So the question is, are these passages in contradiction to Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, or have we largely misunderstood Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and not understood it in its context. You know, life needs to be ordered. When we have disorder and chaos, we have instability, we have lack of growth. These, you know, instability, I mean, I mean rather chaos and disorder are they, they lend themselves to lack of growth and strength and stability. You know, one of the things that young couples, all of us were at one time young couples, one of the things that we learn early on when we have children is that that footloose and fancy-free kind of lifestyle, remember that we used to live before children came along, we realize very quickly that that has to be set aside for an orderly, well-structured home life. I mean, when the child comes along, you know, it's necessary to, you know, have clean clothes at the appropriate time and change diapers at the appropriate time and feed at the appropriate time and, you know, put the little plastic covers on the electrical outlets at the proper time and <laughs> so on and so forth. There has to be order and there has to be structure. Well. Order is necessary in our spiritual lives as well. And another word for order is discipline. And I think a lot of times when we think about discipline within the confines of the church, we only think in negative terms. But the reality is that much of the discipline that takes place in the church is actually very positive. And I want us to consider that as we work through this this afternoon. First of all, let's ask the question and answer it biblically. What is church discipline? As I said earlier, when most people hear the word church discipline, they, they think of only negative forms of discipline. 
and having observed church discipline done poorly and wrongly as well as biblically and accurately over the years of my salvation, I can say that there's nothing more ugly than, than church discipline done unbiblically or wrongly. And usually when you mention church discipline, it's all of those cases where it was not handled biblically that rise up in people's mind. You know, the broken relationships. A lot of times church discipline has been done in such a way that the relationships are broken and severed with no real possibility of them ever being mended or put back together again. That is not ever the purpose of church discipline. That's never the purpose of church discipline. Now don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Now I'm not saying that there's not negative aspects to discipline. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. We don't normally embrace the concept of discipline in our lives. But he goes on in this same passage that we're going to look at later. He said, but after it has been exercised, what does it yield? The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Okay. So it's something that's to be embraced. It's something that's to be very much a part of our church life. Interestingly enough, if you do a little etymological work here, the word disciple and discipline come from the same Latin root. So if we're going to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, then is it not necessary that we be under the discipline of His church. Every one of us, without exception. And the interesting thing is, is that both the word discipline and disciple speak to the idea and are closely related to the concepts of education and order. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says, do, now think about this, guys. Think about the chaos that was ruling at Corinth in, in the context of Paul's first letter to them. I mean, that place was a mess. It, it was a train wreck as far as the church was concerned. And Paul's great concern was to bring some discipline and some order to the chaos that existed there at Corinth. And he comes down toward the end of the letter and he says, Do all things in the church decently and in order. In other words, Corinth, he's calling on you to be disciplined. To be orderly in the way you conduct yourselves. Listen to this quote by J. Adams. I thought this was most excellent. He's, J. Adams says, When we are baptized into the church, we thereby matriculate, I love that word, into Christ's school. I like that concept. We matriculate into Christ's school. We become disciples of Jesus Christ. He said, then for the rest of our earthly life, we are to be taught not just facts alone, but also to obey the commands of Christ. He says, this is education with force. It is education backed up by the discipline of good order that is necessary for learning to take place. I thought that was most excellent. The idea that, that in the church we are in the school of Christ. You don't hear that term used a lot anymore because we've really, in a lot of ways, turned our back on discipleship, which we're going to deal with in more detail in our next lesson. But we do, we do, when we join the church, become a part of the school of Jesus Christ. And all of the preaching and the teaching and the study of God's Word and all of the prayer and all of the fellowship has one point and one point alone, and that is that we become more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ and be conformed more accurately to His image. That is what Jay is calling education with force. 
It's education within the confines of the church, which is the school of Christ, and their need